The universe is deterministic. It's godless and neutral and defined only by physical laws. The marble rolls because it was pushed. The man eats because he's hungry. An effect is always the result of a prior cause. The life we lead, with all its apparent chaos, is actually a life on tram lines. Prescribed, undeviating, deterministic. I know it doesn't feel that way, Sergey. We fall into an illusion of free will because the tram lines are invisible. And we feel so certain about our subjective state. Our feelings, our opinions, judgments, decisions. Then those decisions can only have been the result of something prior. Where you were born, how you were brought up. The physical construction of your particular brain. At the end of the day, cause and effect. I hope you understand what I'm saying, Sergey. You made no decision to betray me. You could only have done what you did. Happy heresies and welcome to the desert of the real. Was I fated to say that? I was according to the clip you just heard, spoken by Forrest the villain technocrat in the series Devs, brilliantly played by Nick Offerman. The show is indeed about determinism, and it's preggers with Gnostic themes, my beloved true seekers. And surprising few, even if you had a choice, our topic will cover free will and other linked subjects. From the view of those ancients who seem larger and larger as our world gets smaller and smaller, partly because our leaders and exemplars have revealed their small nutsacks. I want peace on earth and goodwill toward men. We are the United States government. We don't do that sort of thing. It's bad in 2020. However, the truth is that it's always been bad, but this year the Archons really decided to put all their cards on the table. And now we do the same as Eternal Champions, Johnny Cash Buddy Shutvas, and modern day Tom Sawyers are mine not for rent to any god or government. We put all our cards on the table. And because we ride with Hermes, the god of thieves, and Sophia, the goddess of smugglers, we got so many dangerous cards up our sleeves. Cards of trauma, cards of insanity, cards of ecstasy and of imagination that will win all the chips that are actually our divine spark stolen by hating angels. We were made for this game of Saturn. Beneath this mask, there is more than flesh. Beneath this mask, there is an idea, Mr. Creedy. And ideas are bulletproof. But what if there is no free will? Fuck it. Countering forests from devs, I'll quote David Haller, the schizophrenic anti-hero from the show Legion, right before he goes to fight the demiurgic King of Shadows. This is the end, the beginning, the end. What it all means is not for us to know. It is for history to decide. All we can do is play the parts as written. All we can know is ourselves. I didn't come here to tell you how this is going to end. I came here to tell you how it's going to begin. So welcome to Aeon Bite where it's all about that gnosis to know yourself and win the game of Saturn by putting all your cards on the table. I am still fated to come to you in my meat sack incarnation of Miguel Connor. I am so honored by your company and support, 
and it is my privilege to assist you in remembering how beautiful you were before they made you forget. To help you find your authentic self. Like Jung said, we didn't come to this world to be good, but to be ourselves. And as James True said, this is not a battle of good versus evil. This is a battle of you against the lack of you. I know who I am. After all these years, there's a, there's a victory in that. As faded and as mentioned, we will be discussing free will, as well as divine providence and fate. From the stance of maven minds like Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, Plotinus, and more. From the stance of the Stoics, all the way to, yes, the Gnostics. Do you believe in fate, Neil? No. Why not? Because I don't like the idea that I'm not in control of my life. For this kismet, we are joined again at the Virtual Alexandria by Dylan Burns who will be discussing his new book, Did God Care? Providence, Dualism, and Will in Later Greek and Early Christian Philosophy. Beyond a cool cat and brilliant scholar, Dylan is undoubtedly one of the chief authorities today when it comes to Gnostic studies. I've hung out with him in meat space, so trust me, Dylan is the kind of mind and heart you want around to understand the mysteries of Gnosticism and any ancient philosophy or mysticism. Venerable tradition of sorcerers, shamans, and other visionaries who have developed and perfected the art of dream travel, the so-called lucid dream state whereby consciously controlling your dreams you're able to discover things beyond your capacity to apprehend in your awake state. And you were destined to do this, because the truth is that there is little free will. Beyond the vagaries of the Archons and their rulership of the stars, our programming and the propagandizing from society, our cultural background, parental encrypting, genetic coding, heritage, and so much else makes us into no better than wind-up toys or drooling replicants. Humans fancy that there's something special about the way we perceive the world, and yet we live in loops as tight and as closed as the hosts do, seldom questioning our choices, content for the most part to be told what to do next. But there is a small shard of infinity within us that downloads a higher infinity, and that is our authentic self. Remember the quote by David Haller at the beginning? That all we can do is know ourselves? He's right. Also remember in the Matrix that everything Neo did was telegraphed in the simulation. All he could do was understand, have that gnosis, why he made his choices. That's what liberated him and made him win the card game of Saturn in the end. That's what each one of us can do. Bringing in Jung again, he did say, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. You already know if I'm going to take it? Wouldn't be much of an oracle if I didn't. But if you already know, how can I make a choice? Because you didn't come here to make the choice. You've already made it. You're here to try to understand why you made it. It's that simple, and it's essential information the Gnostics knew, as well as other followers of Hermes and Sophia. Dylan will expand much more, but let me quote Stephen Davis on Gnostic determinism from his book, The Secret Book of John, The Gnostic Gospel. To imprison humanity, the demiurge creates fate. The arrangement of present and future that most people of the ancient world believe govern their lives. Through astrology and other occult systems, people try to know and even manipulate their fate. 
but as a general rule, everyone and everything was under the sway of fate. Even the gods, the angels, and the demons were subject to it. As the body imprisons the soul, fate imprisons the will. You don't understand by now. You can't stop fate. No one can. It's like a living thing. It swallows us all into darkness. If there is a god of fate, Yaldabaoth is that god. We often think of fate as being either good or bad, sometimes pleasant and sometimes not. But for the Sethians, fate is a purely negative concept. It is an impersonal force for the crushing of the human spirit. It is the bars on our prison. But earlier we already heard in the myth that Epinoia, the forethought or Promethean aspect of the alien god, can give us the chance to escape fate forever. You might as well try to change the stars! <laughs> can it be done, Father? Can a man change the stars? Yes, William. He believes enough a man can do anything. Forethought, knowing why you made the choices, using your trickery to win the card game of Saturn, becoming a trickster god that tricks fate like Jesus does in the Gnostic Gospels when he fools the Archons by changing shape and tipping the Zodiac. Keep all that in mind while Dylan Burns discusses his new book, Did God Care? In the end, think of what Jung also said. The privilege of a lifetime is to become who you truly are. This is it. This is what you're here for. This is everything to you. This is victory. Every man is born as many men and dies as a single one. Before we head to the interview, please keep in mind that I am offering my voiceover skills. Aside from using my voice for this infernal venture for more than 14 years, I have done commercials, narrations, and audiobooks. I've got the skill, the professional home studio, and if it's anything esoteric or alternative or just hip, man, I've got the passion to bring soul into your venture and express your brand like it, well, like it was fated to be. And I'll work for you in any Maimon capacity. Is mayonnaise an instrument? No, Patrick, mayonnaise is not an instrument. And thank you to those of you who support this Red Bill Cafeteria. 2020 has been the best year for Aeon Bite. According to statistics, there are about 92,000 religious slash spiritual podcasts out there. I've hit the number 24 spot recently, and I'm continually cracking the top 50, which is incredible for a show on ancient hated heretics the world has never stopped disliking. Thank you for everything and for making this happen. But enough of my drivel. Let us do our interview with Dylan Burns. Oh. But first, David Haller, tell us if there's any freedom or are we stuck in frozen time forever? Lessons in Time Travel, Chapter Zero. Who we were does not dictate who we will be. But often, it's a pretty good indication Time travel does not give one the opportunity to change oneself, but rather to eradicate oneself and allow something else to form in the wake of what once was. And in this is a sort of grace or madness. Because if we don't believe in change, then we don't believe in time. This is the Aeon Byte interview, and with us we 
definitely have the pleasure of having back Dylan Burns to discuss his new book, Did God Care? Studies in Platonism, Neoplatonism, and the Platonic Tradition. Dylan, thanks for coming on Aeon Byte. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Pleasure to have you and uh, really enjoyed our last interview. And as we spoke, I think the audience will love this interview because this is red meat for them. And for many reasons, I really enjoyed your book. But before we get started with your work, I wanted to talk to you about John Turner, who passed away late last year, and he was one of the original translators of the Nag Hammadi. He was also a past guest, and I met him at the Gnostic Counterculture Conference at Rice University. Met you there, and uh, we all had the pleasure of hanging out. I corresponded with him throughout the years, and of course his work has been invaluable in Gnostic, Christian, and Neoplatonic studies. I talked about his passing last year, and uh, I spoke to him right before he left us. And I can't speak enough about him, but perhaps uh, you would like to speak a bit about John Turner. Um, sure. I mean, I suppose you, you've already talked to your listeners about his his contributions to the study of the Nakamadi Library and the relationship between Gnosticism and Neoplatonism, right? Right. I mean, this. So he's been on the show a, a number of times. So, if anybody wants to hear about uh, John's academic work, I, I think there's 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 there are ample resources on other episodes, but. I thought maybe a, a side of John that I could share with you that hasn't been on your show before is what it was like to work with John um, as a teacher, what John was like as a teacher, and what John was like as a mentor. Because I think outside of the immediate scholarly circles he was working with, it's not so widely known how important John was in cultivating younger scholars and in training younger scholars. And I tell you, John's students are everywhere, okay? Uh, some of them became big names at Harvard and Oxford. I'll put it like this. A few years ago, I was at a wedding in rural Pennsylvania, and the mother of the bride was a former student of John Turner's. Wow. Just by coincidence, he stopped me and said, you're the guy who reads Coptic, right? <laughs> well, I learned some of that with John Turner back when I was a graduate student in Montana. I mean, John had a lot of students who went on. This guy became an English professor, incidentally, but they, they went on to do all kinds of things. And so he was, he was really a, a beloved teacher that people were still talking about years later. And many of his students uh, became very successful, like Karen King at Harvard. Um. John was also very important for mentoring younger scholars. That, you may have noticed at the conferences, at the conference that you went to, Gnostic Countercultures, he was always talking to people he didn't know so well and to younger scholars. He was asking them about their work. He was trying to learn about them from, from them about new work and new developments in the field. He was trying to help them make connections. He was trying to raise people up, and he did this tirelessly. From the first time I met him in 2009, he was surrounded by graduate students, all of whom he was cultivating. And he he didn't get paid to do this, you know. Uh, he was a professor, but he didn't have a, a fund to go to a conference and take out a bunch of graduate students and talk to them. He did this because he believed it was really important. And he knew it was one of the most important things you can do for a field, namely to um, train and educate the younger people to whom you will eventually hand it in the future, you know. So he, he did an incredible amount of informal mentoring of younger scholars, myself included. And you can encapsulate that in a Coptic summer camp that he and his wife, Elizabeth, used to host at their home in Nebraska. For years, if you were 
if you if you if you were connected in Coptic circles, you could get invited to Coptic summer camp, where you would fly to Lincoln and spend three weeks reading with John and other students of Coptic in John's kitchen. Wow. And then everybody would make something to eat and go for beers and talk about Coptic afterwards. <laughs> it's pretty cool, right? Yeah. So he he had his his mind was open, but so is his door. Uh, he had terrific generosity of spirit, and for this reason, he's he's beloved amongst uh, so many scholars of of various generations. Uh, there's there really was nobody like him, and he is sorely missed. So it's very strange to me to not be in contact with him now. Oh, agreed. And he was not your typical academic or didn't fall into the typical trope of a professor. He was a smoker. He rode a bike. Uh, I remember him telling me, uh, he was telling me about a trip to Cairo to look at some ancient texts. And he told me that the highlight for him was sitting in a bazaar, having a coffee and smoking some questionable substance that took him to some wonderful places. So he was a a unique pioneering individual. He he definitely lived it. <laughs> he definitely lived it. You know, he was a, a student of Platonism and so he he understood the philosophy that sees the soul and the mind as separate from the body. You know, the message is you are not your body, right? right. The part of you that's thinking the, the real you, that's not this body that you're wearing. That's just a shell. John understood thinking that way. But as long as he was in this body, well, he ran with it. <laughs> <laughs> it was his playground. <laughs> it was it was his playground, and he loved it. Uh, but uh, I, I don't want to make him out to be uh, a decadent only. He was also an athlete. Um, he was on the swim team and the football team in his youth. And he, and he was interested not only in the so-called human sciences, the humanities, but also the natural sciences. He was good with numbers. Uh, and I believe at his, the, at the boarding school where he went to high school, he had a chemistry set where he managed to blow up his room. <laughs> oh no. Wow. <laughs> Well, in, in the, the classic cartoony way, everybody was fine, you know. <laughs> but but the the point is, he he did all kinds of things, and uh, this this extended to the arts as well. He he loved to sing in the choir, and uh, as you your listeners know, he had a wonderful sonorous voice, which you could listen to all day, and this was also a voice he used to sing. That's wonderful, and yeah, an, an incredible mind, uh, a unique individual, and we must keep remembering people like him, people who have passed, to keep them alive, and uh, always, uh, well, never forget John Turner's contribution to Gnostic studies, uh, the Nag Hammadi library itself, uh, and uh, everything that he did was just uh, invaluable, you would say. No question, he he was a, a an amazing scholar to talk about his his contributions on the on the research level you know he was part of the team that first translated the coptic gnostic sources discovered near nag hammadi into english he was a a big part of that project contributed to the the decipherment and initial interpretation of these texts in the from the 60s to the 80s and then he also helped demonstrate why these texts are important by focusing on the world of philosophy. Not, he didn't only look at these texts in the history of early Christian theology. What can they tell us about the early Christian movement and early Christian thought, but also what they can tell us about Greek thought, because we know that Greek versions um, of some of these Coptic texts, that is these Coptic some of the Coptic texts we have from Nag Hammadi are translations of texts that were circulating in Greek, right? And some of these earlier Greek versions we know to have been read by philosophers. 
and discussed by philosophers. They were controversial. And John was really the pioneer for this problem and putting that stuff on the map and then taking it to academic philosophers today and showing them why it's important. Wonderful. Well, um, audience, please check out John Turner's work. I still lean on it when I need insight or something deep. And, uh, well, we just can't say enough, but um, we honor John. And in a way, this show is dedicated to him. So um, let's talk about your book, Dylan, Did God Care? And you mentioned there was a reason you gave it such a provocative title. Um, but were you fated to write this, Dylan? Was it divine providence? You had no choice but to write this. You could look at it that way. That's <laughs> <laughs> the easy way out, right? But the, the, the way I, I came to this book was when I was working on my dissertation that became my first book, Apocalypse of the Alien God. I found all of this language about divine providence in these Nakamadi texts. And Providence is kind of a, a hazy idea, right? I mean, what is it oh, exactly? Yeah. What does it really mean? And I, I, I didn't know either. So I wrote a theologian I knew and asked him, can you, can you send me a citation, a reference for a big introductory book on Providence that will tell me everything I need to know about this word in the ancient world and how I can understand it? And he said, I, I don't know any such book. Actually, so I thought, okay, then I will write the book. <laughs> Ten years later, here we are. <laughs> it was in the world of ideas, and you had to go get it, huh? <laughs> the, well, the the evidence was there. It turned out uh, people have written such books, but they're they're in German uh, or Italian, and they and these are these are wonderful books. But I also thought there should be one in English. And, of course, I had my own perspective on the issues that come up around provenance in later Greek and early Christian philosophy. And so I developed those. Why did God care? This is actually a way of saying in modern idiom, did God have providence? Was there providence or not? Because this is what providence means. Uh, providence as we, that the English word providence comes from the Latin providere, to foresee. And this is in turn a coinage in early Roman philosophy of translating the Greek pronoia for knowing, for thinking. And this for, this for thinking, this forethought, pronoia, is itself a normal way to talk about care or worry. When you have uh, something in mind, you know, you know you got to go, I don't know, get the oil changed in your car. You can say you have pronoia about that. You have care about that. But very early in the history of Greek literature, the term becomes closely associated with the gods and divine care and their interaction with the world. And so, one of the first things I tried to do in this project was look at, okay, providence or this Greek word pronoia. These, these words don't say anything to us in English today in the 21st century. So how can I render it, translate it in a way that accords with the idioms we use now? And it's to say care, actually. Did God care? Is God involved or not? That's what providence is all about. Oh, that makes sense. And uh, too many free will, divine providence, and fate are almost synonyms, or they're intertwined. And your book tries to sort of separate these, doesn't it, and the history and ancient history and how they evolve. Yeah, this is an interesting thing. So, you know, we don't talk about providence in, in everyday language today, but and this is a, a fairly recent development actually. And then how that came to be is, uh, I think would be another book entirely. But, you know, a hundred years ago, or even 75 years ago, a politician could give up, could get up and give a speech talking about divine providence 
or invoking divine providence to explain that what he is describing is part of God's plan or not. People used to talk this way all the time. It's on the Lincoln Memorial, oh, divine wow. providence. Okay. So that we don't talk this way anymore is, is a relatively new thing. But in the ancient world, providence was understood to be a single problem that dealt with a lot of different things, um, mainly uh, three things. First of all, the first of these three being to what extent are the gods involved in what happens here? Secondly, how does that relate to our experience of evil and suffering? To what extent are gods involved in that or responsible for that? And then third, to what extent does that relate to our individual responsibility? Uh, the word free, we, we, we talk about free will today, but you know, free will didn't drop out of the sky as a, as a concept, <laughs> right? It's true. Okay. If, if you, if you go back to the, the first Greek philosophers, say to Plato and Aristotle, you don't see free will there, but what you do find, um, at least in the Hellenistic period, is what is up to us. This is the phrase that uh, the early Greek philosophers used to talk about individual responsibility. Now, providence, the language of providence, is re- covers all three of these issues in ancient literature. And this is part of why it's a difficult topic. If you do what I did and you sit down and you try to look through all of these books and you find all the references to providence, what you find are providence relating to one problem, divine care, how far does it go? And then other passages that are talking about evil and matter and demons, and then still other passages that are talking about free will and divine foreknowledge and individual responsibility. And then you think to yourself, well, it means everything. It means nothing. I don't know where to go. I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> but I tried to sort it out, and that's how I sorted it out. Providence covers three topics in ancient literature, namely the reach of divine care, how that relates to evil, and how that relates to what is up to us. Well said. Yes, these topics are still complicated today, and you see it in science fiction, you know, thinkers t- today speculating on this. So it's something, uh, humanity will continue to struggle with these, uh, with these issues forever. But your book really categorizes and breaks it open and brings a lot of insights into, uh, these issues. Going back, Dylan, uh, going back to ancient Greek times when what we have from the Iliad to Hesiod is, uh, that you assume that everything is under the rule of fate, uh, but still the gods can be as capricious as they are. But it's still our decision whether things are good or evil. Man is still responsible for most of his actions and what he does. Yeah, I mean, early earliest Greek literature, you know, Homer, Hesiod, Greek lyric poetry, this literature is over 2,500 years old. And it predates the earliest philosophy. Okay, so that's not systematic. But what you see about how gods relate to human beings in that literature is that fate is a big thing. Things are going to go the way that they go, that they go. But somehow, you know, the problems that humans make are still human problems. Humans are responsible for what they do. And the, the contradiction there is not something that's, uh, uh, that, that really comes up, you know, the, because these are, these are different traditions, many of them oral that are being put together and discussed in a non-systematic way. But once we arrive at fourth century Athens, then you start to have real philosophers talking about how this stuff works in a systematic way and trying to iron out well, not only solutions, but questions. And so the great example might be Oedipus, right? Things are faded, and no matter what he did, things were going to go as they were going to go, and that's the big lesson to ancient Greeks. That's right. So this is a this is really a, a classic early 
portrayal of Greek conceptions about faith. There's, there's nothing you can do about it. It's a, it is a, well, we would say today it is a fatalistic view of how things go. <laughs> yeah. He couldn't get out of it. But, uh, as you, as you saw in the book, the example of Oedipus and specifically Oedipus's father, Laios, was very important for later philosophers in the Roman period trying to sort out these questions. They all took this up this example and took different cracks at it, coming to different kinds of solutions according to their perspective. And how did the pre-Socratic philosophers deal with divine providence? I think uh, the most uh, striking example, perhaps, and let me know if I'm wrong, would be Epicurus, who simply said, nope, no divine providence, kids. Well, Epicurus is is not a pre-Socratic. He's oh, okay. a, he, he's a Hellenistic philosopher. He's a Hellenistic philosopher. He's post he's post Plato, but he he does stick out. And this is uh, this is absolutely something worth highlighting. One of the one of the fun things about Providence, and also the the kind of wink and nudge in the title of the book. Did God care? Is that almost all of the philosophers in the ancient world would have said, yes, yes, of course God cares. And some of them would have been offended by the question. And the early Christian philosopher Clement of Alexandria would even recommend that you be physically chastised for oh. asking such a terrible question. <laughs> if God cares, <laughs> oh. Oh, my. wrap him on the knuckles, you know. <laughs> But so, but there were there were some philosophers who said, "Well, the gods don't seem to care, do they?" And mostly, these were individuals who belonged to the school of the Hellenistic philosopher Epicurus. Epicurus argued that the gods do exist, and they are happy, and they are perfect, and they are so happy and so perfect. They could not possibly be bothered to be creating, running, or in any way involved with a world as screwy as ours. <laughs> Smart gods. <laughs> Smart gods. Stay yeah. out of it. They, they, yeah, they, they, yeah. they simply stay out of it. So it, this, this was a, a, a perspective that was rejected by almost everybody else in the ancient world, and the Epicureans were usually called atheists by their opponents. But this is a, a, a misnomer, actually. They were not atheists. They said, in fact, their, their reason for explaining how why it is that the gods do not care is that a god that exists in any way worthy of the name God would be a god that's not responsible for what we see down here. How would uh, Plato and the Platonists approach divine uh, providence? Uh, I think it's, I think on a little side note, it's interesting that um, you deal a lot with Timaeus and the creation or the ordering of chaos by the the Demiurge. And what struck me out is that uh, the Demiurge, as you write, uh, does this best job to order the universe, but it's far from perfect. There's, uh, I guess, uh, glitches in the matrix, if you would. And then it's, it seems perhaps he pulled out and let these younger gods sort of manage things. And I was thinking, well, later on with Paul and the Gnostics and the book of Enoch, it's, uh, it's no wonder they would have come to these conclusions because Plato isn't Plato sort of coming to these ideas of the imperfect uh, material world. Yeah, I, I think you're totally right. But it's a bit of a, a glass half full, glass half empty sort of thing, right? Mm -hmm. Because Plato is not a pessimist. He's unambiguous about the world being a living creature, a created, a wonderful created living creature that has been made as good as it possibly can be through the provenance of the craftsman, the Demiurge. Okay? This is a Timaeus 29 to 30. But 
we do see some problems in the world, don't we? And in the Timaeus, um, which for your readers, for, for your listeners unfamiliar with the dialogue is arguably the most important work of cosmology in the Western tradition outside the Bible. Extraordinarily influential, uh, all the way up to early modernity. In the Timaeus, he gives two reasons for imperfection in the world. Uh, one is, like you said, there's the fact that the world is made out of matter. It's made out of stuff. <laughs> and there's a, there's a kind of chaos that comes along with the fact of this stuff being in what he calls uh, the receptacle, that is the space that matter and the world occupy. There's, and this, this is what creates, uh, well, which is in the matrix. And then there's also the fact that the creator steps back from the creation, exactly as you say, and hands the world off to what Plato calls the young gods, who Plato clearly understands to be the gods of Greek mythology and cult, the gods of Greek popular Greek religion, to run things. And so Plato can then step back and say, well, the world is made as good as it possibly can be, but it's not crazy of you to see imperfections around you because, well, we are made out of material. There's no world without material. That's just a fact of life. And the gods that have been put in charge of running things are not the creator himself. However, in another dialogue, the laws, Plato alludes to a theme that comes up in a number of his other dialogues, namely the Phaedrus and the Republic. And that's reincarnation. This is a third solution for the problem of evil in Plato. Namely, what you experience in this life is a consequence of the life of you having chosen the life that you have in the present body, in the present time, before you descended from heaven into your body. As you go through a cycle of lives, in between your lives, you go up to heaven and you make a choice about what life you're going to have next. And this is uh, this reincarn- theme of reincarnation is uh, very important for Plato. And it has a, a number of functions in his philosophy. But one of them is also to explain what kind of experiences we have in the present life, including bad ones. Makes sense and well said. And um and how did Plato view the knowledge or how the one might know what's going on? I guess omniscience, and this is a theme that you deal with and, of course, thinkers would deal with. Basically, it's kind of like uh, where does the buck stop? Because even later on, the Gnostics, some of uh, emailed me and they're like, well, what's this? They're always throwing Sophia or the Demiurge under the bus. What about the one? What about the, the God above God? And you write that, uh, quote, while God does not determine or even know particular contingent choices, which are, these choices are literally up to us. So, so Plato basically said the one wasn't really omniscient about or really involved itself in the lower world. Yeah, you don't, you don't see anything about the, the one being involved with creation in Plato. Um, and the, the creator deity, the demiurge in the Timaeus, he's not called the one. The identification of, uh, some kind of first principle with the demiurge is, is a, a rarity in the early Platonic tradition. And you, you only find it in, in the Roman period. Um, in fact, it is precisely to preserve the transcendence of the one, much as the Epicureans tried to preserve the happiness and well-being of the gods, <laughs> that we have something like these fallible creator deities in ancient literature, the most striking of them being, of course, the malevolent creators of Gnostic myth. To relate this to the question of divine omniscience and foreknowledge, 
This is something that uh, Plato himself does not talk much about. But another one of the Hellenistic schools, the Stoa, okay, named, this means, uh, Stoa is plural for the porches, the pillars. So these are, this is where they would hang out in Athens, on the porches in Athens. The Stoa would, uh, uh, come to argue that the gods are omniscient and they are involved in Greek cultic divinatory practices. And they are also involved in determining everything that happens. They see the whole world as having been determined and caught up in a supreme causal principle that is the sum of divineness itself. And the gods know everything that's going to be determined that, or that has been determined before it will happen. And they communicate this to human beings sometimes. And this is where you run into problems about, well, okay, if a god tells you that you're going to do something really bad, are you responsible for that? Because mm. the god yeah. determines that you are going to do it when he told you, right? <laughs> And this, this was, uh, something, this question, um, was posed to the Stoics by their opponents, uh, on a number of occasions over the centuries. And different kinds of answers were, were given. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. It's a complex topic. And, uh, with the Stoics, again, it really comes down to uh, agreeing with Plato and many of the other, uh, Greek thinkers. Yeah. The universe is fine. Uh, any evil is really human. It's a responsibility of the human. Yeah, as far as evil goes, there are, there are two main responses uh, among the Stoa. One is there there is no such thing. Anything you think is evil, it's not really evil. You know, take natural disasters, earthquakes, and typhoons. This is the earth cleaning up after itself. It's mother nature cleaning house. <laughs> you think it's all about you? It's not. It's about the planet taking care of itself. That's one answer. And then the other answer is there are bad things, really bad things that humans experience, but this is only involved on the human level. There's no evil but the evil that men do. And they had an interesting view about the eternal return. It was that the universe recycled and the gods would be recycled over and over again. That's right. So the Stoic physics, everything is made of a kind of divine fire that is a a great explosion. And it underlies everything that we see. This is where all activity comes from. The, this is the active principle that animates the passive principle that is uh, uh, the that is pure matter, inert matter that has, can do nothing on its own. So all the material objects we're interacting with are being animated and moved around by this divine fire. They call it fire, they call it God, they call it pneuma or spirit, and they also call it pronoia, providence, because it is altogether good and altogether benevolent. So arguing that, along with Plato, that things have been made as good as they possibly can be, and there's nothing wrong with any of it, this means that the world is uh, in a way, as as perfect as it can be. There's no improving upon it. Now, the Stoa didn't see the world as eternal, like Plato and Aristotle. The eternity of the world is a kind of, uh, uh, almost a dogma in ancient Greek philosophy. All the Greek philosophers like to talk about the ancient world, uh, about the created world as existing forever. They didn't see it as coming to an end. But the Stoa did it in a bit of a different way. They thought the world would go in cycles, right? So there's a big bang where the divine fire comes out and animates all of matter. We see history transpiring before us. And there will be a 
a great conflagration, a great fire at the end where the, the world is, explodes again and is over. Then it will repeat because there's not going to be nothing at the end of the world. Rather, there will be another creation. And because the gods will do that creation as good as it possibly can be, then the perfection of the new creation can only be identical with the initial creation, right? Mm -hmm. So if the gods are only going to create a completely good world, a world that is as good as it possibly can be, then to deviate from the plan would only be to subtract from the goodness of the world. Therefore, it has to repeat over and over again. We keep getting the same worlds over and over again. Some of your listeners who like to read Nietzsche may be familiar with this idea. It's something that Nietzsche mentions and, and parodies, right? And Uspensky too, although he doesn't parody, he buys into it. <laughs> he buys into it. Oh, it's a, well, for Nietzsche, it's a, it's a horrible idea. You know, this is, this is the most <laughs> ghastly thing that, that the Greeks ever came up with, right? We'll have 2020 over again and again. Yeah, right? we'll have well, 2020 over again. You and I will have this conversation over again. All of it, all of it's going to be the same because this, the gods couldn't, gods in their infinite wisdom couldn't have made it any other way. For us not to have 2020 or for you and I not to have had this conversation, this would subtract in some mysterious way from the great goodness that is the created world. And so the, the, the Stoa argued that you have the providential creation repeating itself over and over again. It's interesting um, for providence and foreknowledge because only one witness, a, a, a late witness, Nemesius of Emesa, a fourth century Christian philosopher, he preserves the argument that the gods are the only thing, are the only things to survive the repeated conflagrations or great fires that destroy the world and out of which the new world is created over and over again. And so because the gods have experienced everything before and the new and the, the next round of the world will be exactly the same as the first one, they know exactly what's going to happen. And this is how they can tell you, you know, that what Oedipus or his father are going to do uh -huh. because they saw the same movie an infinite number of times already. Incidentally, it does so not sound to me like the gods in the Stoic perspective get to be blessed and happy as the Epicurean <laughs> gods, right? <laughs> they have to watch the same movie over and over again for eternity. I mean, but that, like but that is Bill exactly. Murray and Groundhog Day. They're just so, like, so totally, ah. totally. They, they get an infinity of 2020s, but the Stoa are optimists about all this. Yeah. Fascinating. And, um, how did Aristotle view divine providence? You write, uh, well, you basically write, there is none, but the God should be feared. The divine naturally penetrates everything. So that was Aristotle's view, basically. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, Aristotle does not say much about divine providence. The, uh, what, what he, when he talks about God, you know, God is a kind of a divine mind thinking itself. And, and over and infinitely for eternity. And you can identify this, this mind on some level with what Aristotle in his physics calls the, the first mover or the prime mover. All the stuff that we see around us has been put into motion because something pushed it, right? And there has to be some first principle that gives the push to everything else. The, the chain of, of, moving objects that move other moving objects that explain all the movement we see in the sensory world. This first mover, this prime mover, is the, the deity thinking itself. How does a deity that only thinks itself come to move everything? 
Aristotle doesn't tell us this. And this identification of the two is something you see in the later tradition. But it, it's clear that Aristotle has some kind of ident- identifi- identification like this in mind. And then you see in his uh, political writings that he does not advocate getting rid of religion. Nor do writers who follow Aristotle, such as the author of a work called De Mundo on the world, who's uh, clearly posing as Aristotle and whose text was transmitted under the name of Aristotle, so we call him pseudo-Aristotle. This author clearly sees the first, clearly sees the deity as omnipresent, even if he's not active and directly active in everything around us. And there are a lot of uh, analogies the author of De Mundo uses. The most memorable for us and certainly one of the most influential analogies that we see used by this author is that of the great king of Persia. The idea is that the king of Persia has this enormous realm. He's in his palace, and it's a huge palace. And there's a whole army of courtiers and people working for him, servants, guards. And then from this palace, he has uh, generals and governors who also work for him and go out and administrate parts of the empire. This extends all the way to the borders of the empire itself. In other words, there is a kind of presence of this king or emperor insofar as you have a kind of influence as far as the empire goes, right? Even if this emperor or king is not physically present everywhere. And this was a very important way of conceiving how God can be present even when he's not really present for the pseudo-Aristotelian author of this work, the Mundo or on the world. Mm, fascinating. And at the same time, uh, he, Aristotle doesn't seem to, um, I don't know, care or even decide there is free will. There is a uh, one section you talk about Aristotle using four key terms to describe his theory of action is um, what is up to us. What is voluntary, what is chosen and desire, i.e. the object of choice. But then you uh, put this really cool quote uh, that goes, uh, Will can choose to walk to the store or I can choose to walk to the store or I can fail to walk to the store. Our character decides, not our will. That's pretty nuanced in a way, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. The, so the, 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 the point of highlighting these different terms that Aristotle uses for talking about uh, action and intention is that while in, in, in late antiquity, once Christians arrive on the scene, you know, the big theorists for providence are the Stoics. They're the people who wrote the most about it. And their ideas are very congenial to early Christian ideas from the Bible about how God works. But when it comes to action and responsibility, well, the big theorist there was Aristotle. And even the Stoa, who also wrote a lot about this topic, were using the terms that Aristotle came up with and were trying to respond to him. So Aristotle really uh, set the terms of the debate for talking about action and intention. Yeah, the one of the interesting things I found from reading about Aristotle's theory of action that, that you point out here is that you can you can choose what you're going to do, but this is these these choices don't tell us about uh a part of you, uh, a little a little voice in your head that says, well do I want this or not? This idea of an autonomous, a a faculty that is autonomous, that makes decisions, this isn't really what Aristotle is talking about. 
he's interested in talking about character. What makes people act the way that they do, right? So, you know, philosophers like to take mundane examples like, am I going to walk to the store or is my character going to be such that I will fail to walk to the store? And what you do when right you forget time. your mask and you have to walk yeah, yeah. back. Well, that, that's, that's a, that's a good example. That's a good example. Let's, let's raise the stakes yeah. a little bit, right? Okay. Am I, so the, the Aristotle frames this question, the mask question, not as do I choose to wear a mask or not? He frames it as, am I going to wear a mask or am I going to be the sort of person who fails to recognize that it is right to wear a mask when I go to the store and I better put the darn thing on? <laughs> because for, in these early, in these early Greek philosophical discussions about character and uh, about action, and responsibility, you know, the, these discussions are not simply just logical games. They were, they were interested in real stakes at play in their societies. Namely, how do we educate people to do what is right and make a city where people are going to make good decisions and become good or at least effective rulers? Okay. Anybody who's reading Aristotle has got to be educated enough to be terrifically privileged and probably in a position of authority of some kind. So how do we educate this person so that they're going to be able to behave in a way that's going to benefit themselves and everyone around them, right? So this is why Aristotle was asking these questions in the first place. And consequently, the upshot for him is, well, how do we build good character? No, that makes perfect sense. Well, we want to start getting to Christianity so we can, uh, and Judaism so we can really get into the Gnostics because I know that's something the audience really wants to cover and your book does exactly that. Uh, so Dylan, what were some of the innovations or tectonic shifts that, uh, Christians and Jews brought into the conversation when they started coming up on the scene? I think. I think the basic one would be uh, they thought that God could be a personal God instead of this distant uh, dude beyond the beyond the dimensions. Well, it's you're, you're right. They were they were very interested in a very personal deity, a God that's active and intervenes in history, because this is what you see in biblical literature, right? Right. You know, Sarah can't get pregnant with Abraham. God's going to make it happen. Moses comes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go. Pharaoh thinks about it for a minute. And then God hardens Pharaoh's heart. He wants Pharaoh to keep the Jews in Egypt a little bit longer so we can punish the Egyptians a little <laughs> bit more. Because God has a plan. He wants to make a point with that story, right? This was also an important passage for free the question of free will and what kind of god is this anyways <laughs> that's <laughs> that's working with pharaoh it's true it's true uh, origin and the marcionites you know they right. they they, de they debated this this the, the, these these passages so you've got an interventionist god however the interventionist plural deity that we see in so much biblical literature is not necessarily more personal than the gods that were known to Greek philosophers. So Stoic philosophers, of course, talked about the gods as being omnipresent, especially where virtue is involved. In Stoic philosophy, when you're being reasonable, when you're acting in concordance with reason, you are also acting in concordance with a divine plan. Because this, this fire that animates everything that I mentioned earlier, that's also not just Theuma or Pronoia, it's also Logos, reason. Mm. The fire is active and reasonable and good. And so when you act reasonably and good and wear your mask when you go to the store and not drink too many beers and do the right thing when you're in 
tough situations, then you are acting in concordance with the deity. The God is attending to you in some way. We see this, for example, in the thought of the second century Roman Stoic Epictetus, writing in the second century CE, as well as in writers who are dealing with uh, understanding historical events in some philosophical terms. A great example is uh, the writer Plutarch, the a later first century Platonist who also wrote a lot about Greek and Roman history and politics. Fortune smiles upon the wise. And the wise here means the virtuous. So act well and God will attend to you. Now that's pretty personal, right? Right. So the innovation that you see among early Jewish and Christian writers and transforming and, and trying to articulate the God of biblical literature in philosophical terms is not necessarily to make him more personal. You've got a personal deity already in Greek and Roman literature, but it's to identify this deity not with the gods of Greek and Rome, but with the God of Israel. They switch the identity of the deity out. It's not Zeus, it's Yahweh. And that is a very big deal. Yeah, but then that sort of lowers Yahweh, doesn't it, in a way? I mean, Zeus is still one of the younger gods. Ah, interesting. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I mean, for a Stoic, not necessarily, but for Plato, yes. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I mean, Seneca writes about how Jupiter is uh, the, the primary cause of everything, hmm. but he's, he's not transcendent. The Stoic God is, is, is a pantheistic deity. He's present everywhere. And the, Something else you, you, something you see with, uh, the, the God of the Bible, including in these early Jewish and Christian philosophical texts, is that this deity is very powerful indeed, but also all present. And this is very much in keeping with the Stoic deity. But you're right that this brings up questions about transcendence, right? Right. And, once you start to get Christian Platonists, well, then we need to separate the real deity from the one who's doing the making. Exactly. And uh, what other innovations would you say Christians and Jews did? I mean, weren't they, they, did they really bring about uh, the question of free will into the whole philosophical game or anything else, Dylan? That's a great example of what uh, one of the the bigger themes of the book. So the book doesn't just try to describe provenance in later Greek philosophy, or rather in Greek philosophy from the pre-Socratics to uh, Plotinus and the Gnostics in the third century, but it also tries to describe uh, some of the innovative character of early Christian philosophy. So this emphasis on the personal deity because of the importance of biblical proof texts for early Christians, We've, we just talked about that, and you brought up a second thing, which is free will. You know, if you, if you go and read philosophical textbooks about free will, when they begin with the history of the idea, they usually go back to St. Augustine, okay? You know, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden making a decision. Maybe they'll go for, back further from him to Aristotle. So important for setting the terms of the debate, although Aristotle does not talk about a free will at all. He talks about character and behavior. Maybe a little bit about the Stoa, but they stop there. Now that's a big jump, okay, from Aristotle and the Stoa to Augustine. This is, you know, six or seven hundred years. Oh, yeah. What happens in between, right? I'll tell you what happens. The Christians show up. <laughs> <laughs> We're here. The, here, here, the the <laughs> debate, the debate about human responsibility does not advance much from the Stoa until you 
get to early Christian philosophy. Now, some early Christian writers like Theophilus or Irenaeus, they do mention Adam and Eve as an important way to explain that there's some kind of decision-making facility that human beings have. But they don't say much about it. These passages are that's surprisingly brief, you know. You, you think that they would write a whole book on it. Instead, they give it a few sentences and then move on to the next subject. It's interesting. Not a lot of Adam and Eve as far as decisions and free will goes in the earliest Christian literature. But what you see in the long discussions of the question of human responsibility, which are preserved for us from the early church, the three longest, these are the fragments of Basilides, some would call him a Gnostic thinker, preserved by Clement of Alexandria. And second, the so-called Book of the Laws of the Countries, preserving either the thought of the Syrian philosopher Bardaitsam of the second century, or the school organized around him. And then third, a treatise on free will written by Origen of Alexandria in the early third century. These are three, the three longest discussions of free will we have before Christian philosophy takes off in the fourth century after Constantine. Okay. And in each of these discussions, you don't see a lot about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Instead, what you see discussions about are Plato. This idea that before the soul descended into the body, it was already making decisions. This is a very important idea for Basilides, for Bardaitson, or his school in the Book of the Laws of the Countries, and for Origen. Clements is very critical of something, of Basilides' claim that martyrs that we see being tortured by the Romans are being punished for sins committed in a previous life or decisions made before they came into the present body. What kind of body a soul descends into, according to Bardaitsan, is something that the soul determines before it actually descends. This is why people wind up in different situations in life, living in different cultures around us. And Origen, of course, was notorious for arguing that human souls are these divine intellects without bodies that cohabitated around God, contemplating God, and then fell away from him. They go back and forth, back and forth. So what's, so the, the earliest, in, in all of these discussions, you start to see uh, as, a, as a, a way of addressing the question of human responsibility with respect to this idea that the soul was making decisions before it was in the body. This is where you first see systematic philosophical discussion of there being some kind of faculty making decisions in the first place, that there's some part of you that decides I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that, X or Y, A or B. It was before you came into the body that you did that, or that there was something that could do that. And that's actually what a free will is. Dylan, uh, we are at the end for the audience. Uh, there is so much more that Dylan talks about in his book, Did God Care?, including a lot of the Gnostic texts like Zoroastrianos and Allogenes, uh, Marsanus, the Platonizing Gnostics, and of course, Check out our previous interview where we talk about his excellent book, The Apocalypse of the Alien God. And his book covers Philo of Alexandria, Origen, Clement, Neopythagorean, Pythagoras. I mean, just the whole gamut. This is the book about free will, divine providence, and fate that you want to check out. But again, we are at the end. So, Dylan, thank you very much for coming on Aeon Byte and giving us your time and your gnosis. Thank you so much for having me. It was a real pleasure. Keep looking for knowledge. Amen. I agree with you. Thank you. 
And there you have it, my beloved True Seekers. The first part of our interview with Dylan Burns. Quite a bit of varying views, eh? And it may seem complicated, but sometimes all you need is that one piece of insider data to stir your own revelation and find that freedom from fate. In our second part, we'll get into the Gnostics and their ideas on free will, fate, and providence. This will include Basilides and the questionably Gnostic Marcion. Get ready for talk on astral fate and the Archons. We'll finally get into another giant, Plotinus, and his views on these topics. And Dylan will point out that Plotinus might have stolen philosophical ideas from the Gnostics, including the emanation theology of Valentinus. Dylan will share how Gnosticism itself is not actually about solving the problem of evil, but something entirely else. Then he'll talk about the simulation theory and the brain in the vat concept that will blow you away. And much more. So become an AB Prime member or Patreon at Patreon for the full episode. Only $6.99 a lunar cycle or whatever you want to pledge on Patreon. You won't find this Gnostic content or many of our guests anywhere in cyberspace or even meat space. When you subscribe, it will cost you about a buck per episode, and that's a deal of many lifetimes. Membership includes full access to the Archives with more than 14 years of quality interviews. You'll also get an invitation to the Inner Sanctum of Gnosis Facebook group and the Discord channel, where many past guests hang out there, and I'm always there to answer your questions and share with you. Even support in the form of some shekels to PayPal or the US mail really, really helps. I also have the new merch store and an Amazon wish list as I always need equipment in this universe of entropy. Finding Hermes is live and so are our virtual Alexander exclusive private meetings that include spiritual and mental exercises loyal to the ancient Gnostics and a whole lot of stimulating conversation on many heretical topics and a Q&A. You can win this card game of Saturn, break fate enough to find your true and higher self, find that destiny for you and only you, and then do so many wonders. Thanks for being here, thanks for being yourself, your true self, here in the desert of the real. Hello and goodbye as always. 